Um, at UW-Madison, I run the Biosocial Equity Lab, um, where I work with students, um, and we use biological and social data uh, to look at how social inequality affects health across the life course. Um, it's a very interdisciplinary lab. I work with students in economics, sociology, uh, population health, epidemiology, and uh, biostatistics. So it's really a, a team-based science lab approach, and I also work with students individually. Um, I just launched a new website that I'm really proud of, so um, if you're interested in looking more into our work, you can uh, check that out as well. And one more thing too as well, this is just a, a screenshot from the, the website, is that because I do sit in a, in a public policy school, that's always at the forefront of what I'm thinking about, our policy implications of my work. So not just understanding social mechanisms that affect health, but also when in the life course, people are most sensitive to adverse exposures biologically. Um, and the overarching goal is, is really to identify policy targets um, that can increase quality of life uh, and extend human health span, or those number of years that we live life without disability. All right, so just to give you an overview of the talk, um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about biological aging and the geroscience hypothesis to really motivate uh, the work that you're going to see today. Uh, then I'm going to delve into epigenetics and why it's so important for aging research. Uh, we'll talk about DNA methylation, its function, and how it's quantified typically in population studies that you all might be interested in using. Um, and then we'll talk about these epigenetic aging measures or epigenetic clocks. Um, how many of you have heard of epigenetic clocks? Lot. Yeah, it's kind of taken the, the aging world by storm, so we'll talk about those. Um, then I'll show you an application of my research on epigenetic aging uh, to research on fetal origins. And then finally, I'll discuss some ongoing and future work um, and how that dovetails with promises and pitfalls that I, I see right now in the field. So to motivate the talk, let's talk about aging and let's talk about biological aging. So formally aging is the gradual accumulation of cellular damage across the life course that leads to physiological deterioration, loss of function and increased vulnerability to death. And there are several biological hallmarks that are thought to drive the rate of aging. Um, and these include epigenetic alterations. Um, so I'll just step away for a second. This is showing all the different uh, biological hallmarks that are being studied extensively in aging. We see things like telomere attrition that you might've all heard of. Um, genomic instability, stem cell exhaustion, but we're just going to be focusing on this one little piece of the pie here on epigenetic alterations. But these are all interconnected. So that's just something to be aware of that uh, this is just one way to, to look at and, and to study biological aging. We all know that chronological age is arguably the strongest risk factor for most chronic diseases, uh, but as it turns out, it's a really imperfect measure of aging. And that's because the aging process is not linear, right? Some of us are aging faster, some of us are aging slower. And so this rate of aging can really differ across individuals. And so that's why reliable biomarkers are really needed that can capture the biological aging process. Um, so these biomarkers might help elucidate factors that influence aging, and they might also enable discoveries that can halt slow or even reverse the aging process. And that's really been something that's been a huge goal uh, in the field of geroscience. Um, so geroscience aims to understand the relationship between biological aging and age-related diseases at the molecular level. So this is really a, a you know, biological scientist, molecular scientist that are doing this kind of work, a lot of times in animal models. Uh, and in this discipline, there's something known as the geroscience hypothesis. And this is that aging itself is the root cause of all age-related diseases. And so because of that, strategies to modify biological drivers of aging could slow the progression of aging and prevent or delay the onset of multiple chronic diseases. So rather than waiting until people have gotten to the point where they're starting to accumulate all these comorbidities and you're kind of playing whack-a-mole to try to you know, get all of those um, under control, if we could start much earlier in the life course, and, and um, you know, kind of have therapies that could actually delay or reverse the aging process, that would be hugely desirable and would have huge effects on, on population aging and health. And this is this sort of intoxicating promise. Um, I took that from Terry Moffitt, 
Um, and I think it's a really good way of describing, uh, you know, what this geroscience hypothesis um, could, could offer us. But what's really key again to this field is developing an estimator of biological aging that is robust, precise, reliable, and sensitive to change. This is, this is really critical. And this has been something that I'll say geroscientists and uh, gerontologists have been looking for for decades. So why should social scientists care about this agenda? First, and I think this is really huge, is earlier identification of faster agers who are at risk before the onset of disease and mortality. Uh, so for a lot of us who study aging, you know, we're looking at people, you know, 50 plus, 55 plus, 65 plus, and that's already a selected set of individuals, right? Mortality selection has already set in. And so oftentimes we're not seeing in these data sets individuals who uh, passed away earlier, who were not able to capture in what we're doing. Um, and so if we could see much earlier in the life course, when these disparities in aging start to emerge, uh, that would be hugely helpful to our research on, on life course and, and aging. Second is I think there's a lot of work that's gonna be ne needed to be done in terms of supporting the translation from animal models to humans. So this leap from lab to life, as they say. So a lot of work has been done in mice and C. elegans, um, but we need more causal research in humans. And I think population researchers um, can really help, you know, do more quasi-experimental design, more causal uh, research outside the lab to really help identify the environmental and behavioral risk factors that are associated with accelerated aging. The next is really to inform the design of clinical trials and anti-aging therapies. Um, so to help scientists pre-register important social variables that we know matter um, to help ensure population representation and how these clinical trials are conducted. Um, they need that from us. And lastly, really to examine how a successful ger geroscience agenda might affect the economy, population demographics, inequality, and healthcare costs. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about epigenetics. So what does the epigenome do? Um, it turns out we have this massive DNA packaging problem uh, because we have to fit five feet of DNA into a nucleus with a diameter of six micrometers. That's one millionth of a meter. Um, and so that's been compared to fitting Mount Everest into a grain of rice. So this is a huge feat that our cells are performing constantly all day um, within us, right? And so here you can see, um, I'm gonna step over here again. Here we have the, the DNA unwound. So this is typically how you'll see it in pictures. But in order for it to fit into the nucleus, it has to get wound really tightly around these histones and so forth into these chromatin fibers. And then it's in this really uh, dense inert packaged state with inside the nucleus. But unfortunately, the RNA transcriptional machinery can't read the DNA in this state. The DNA has to be unwound in order for the transcriptional machinery to come in, read the DNA, create an mRNA transcript that can then go outside the cell to create, uh, outside the nucleus to create a protein. So DNA plays a huge role um, both in proper packaging of the genome across cell division cycles, but also in uh, regulatory influence on gene expression. So it's really controlling at any given time how the DNA is open in the cell so that it can be uh, read by, by the uh, uh, RNA, uh, the transcriptional machinery. There are several different types of epigenetic regulation. Um, and I think this is important to know because people say epigenetics broadly, but epigenetics can mean different things. Um, we have DNA methylation, uh, histone tail modifications or chromatin accessibility. And there's also non-coding RNAs. So these are RNAs that don't code proteins, but that can silence genes by wrapping themselves around them. Um, I think this is the, the mechanism that's used to silence one of the X chromosomes um, in uh, uh, women. Um, but today we're just gonna be focusing on DNA methylation. Um, this is the most well-studied epigenetic modification. And it's the one that you're gonna see profiled in studies that you're interested in using, um, again, in these larger epidemiological cohorts. So let's talk a little bit more about DNA methylation. 
Um, formally, this is just when a methyl group is added to a DNA molecule at, at a cytosine base. So um, if you remember from your high school biology, our DNA is made up of uh, four nucleotide bases that pair together, right? So adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Um, and this is, you'll see just a covalent bond that attaches itself uh, to, uh, I think the fifth position, my biochemistry is not good. Um, so this is a, this is a methylated uh, CPG site. In mammals, DNA methylation is almost exclusively found at what are called CPG sites. Um, so this is just formally when a cytosine nucleotide is followed by a guanine on the DNA strand. And so that's where you'll see these methyl marks attached to the cytosine base. So it has to be where a C is followed by a G, uh, which doesn't occur as frequently um, in, the, in, in our DNA. When it's located in a gene promoter region, a methylated CPG site typically represses gene expression. So not always, but typically uh, if we see methylation in these promoter re regions, those are regions kind of prior to the actual gene body that are oftentimes regulating whether or not that gene gets transcribed. And if that is methylated, uh, the transcriptional machinery won't come down and, and, and read the DNA. Um, there's several important characteristics of DNA methylation. Um, as we've been talking about, it controls which genes are active and it plays a role in several key cellular processes because of that, uh, things like cell differentiation. So whether a cell is a muscle cell or a skin cell, it's really regulating that because the DNA is the same inside the nucleus of all those cells. Aging, which we're gonna talk more about, um, and cancer. So this is also huge in, in cancer biology. It's influenced by the environment, which I think is of huge importance to, to social scientists, right? That's what we care about. And it's under partial genomic control. So uh, it's influenced both by the environment and also by our genes. Um, it's modifiable, which is important. It's, and that's, I think, a big reason why it's being targeted as a potential um, therapeutic, uh, you know, therapies are being developed to potentially target DNA methylation to change the status of methylation because it is modifiable and it can change over time. So how is it typically measured and quantified in population studies? Uh, epidemiological cohorts uh, use microarray data. So again, these are the cohorts that we're more likely to use. Um, and here they're using a methylation bead chip. Uh, the most recent one is the EPIC array, and that captures about 850,000 uh, CPG sites. Um, so it doesn't capture all the CPG sites, but a selection of about 850,000. And these are using fluorescent probes to quantify the percent methylation. The common data output that you'll get after a lot of QC has happened uh, in the lab is what's called a beta value. And that's just the proportion of methylated cells at a given CPG site. So within a population of cells, it's uh, the average methylation at a given CPG site, uh, again, within a proportion of cells or within a, a selection of cells. Uh, it typically has a binomial distribution, as you'll see. So um, this is showing uh, that its uh, cells are usually 100% methylated at a given CPG site or not at all. But there is some, some variation there in between as well. Uh, the number of population studies with DNA methylation data is increasing, so it's now affordable and feasible to measure this in larger samples. Um, the health and retirement study, uh, which we'll be using today, has methylation data on over 4,000 people. Um, Add Health, I don't think they've released it yet, but they have collected it. Uh, Fragile Families, uh, which you all are familiar with, uh, MESA, and so forth. And this is an, an exhaustive list, but just to give you kind of a flavor for some different studies that are now profiling this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these, these epigenetic clocks. So these are the most robust and accurate biomarkers of biological aging to date. And formally what they are is just a composite score of CPG sites that are highly associated with either chronological age or phenotypes of aging. And we'll talk about that distinction on the, on the next slide. And what they, how they're built is that they regress chronological age or phenotypic age on a set of CPGs 
using a supervised machine learning method in a training sample. So typically penalized regression like elastic net. And then from that, it selects the CPG sites that are most highly associated with, with age or uh, with phenotypic aging. And from that, you can create uh, what's known as epigenetic age. So this is just a linear weighted average of methylation levels where the weights are just the regression coefficients um, from the elastic net. And so you can take this in a training sample, then apply it to your test sample and calculate epigenetic age. Uh, so this is gonna spit out this algorithm a person's biological age. You can then compare that to their chronicle, chronological age to see if they're aging faster or slower and by how much. And that's typically the measure that you'll see folks using is um, epigenetic age acceleration. So this is the deviation between epigenetic age and chronological age. There are over 30 epigenetic aging measures to date that have been developed for adults. And there are also uh, measures for children. So there are pediatric clocks. Uh, there are also uh, measures for newborns. There are gestational age clocks. I'm just gonna be talking about the ones in adults for today. And these are constructed using different training phenotypes, different training samples, and across different tissue types. So here, sorry, this is a little dense, but I think it's helpful to see the evolution of this research over time. Um, so I'm just gonna step away again to show you. Um, so Steve Horvath, uh, back in 2013, so over a decade ago, uh, developed the first clock. Uh, he trained it on chronological age um, across uh, 51 different tissues and cells. Um, and it, uh, the feature, uh, the machine learning algorithm shows 353 CPG sites. From there, we can see the evolution of others that were developed to measure chronological age. These are generally referred to as first generation measures. As time went on, it became apparent that although these were really predictive of chronological age, what we really want to predict is biological age, right? That's what we're really, really interested in. And so then uh, the second generation clocks began to develop, and these were trained on uh, clinical markers that were related to mortality risk and also on mortality risk. So these are developed kind of using a two-step procedure where first you're training the CPG sites on different clinical markers that are related uh, to aging and health. And then from there, you're training them on time to death uh, or risk of mortality. Um, and then more recently, we have these third generation measures. Uh, so these were developed by Dan Belsky in the Dunedin study. And what's so unique about these is it's looking at the rate of change across 18 different biomarkers in people of the same chronological age. So up here, they were using cross-sectional data where everyone was a different chronological age. Down here, they're measuring this in the same people over time who are the same chronological age. So you get the rate of aging, and uh, you're not kind of as worried about confounding from, from cohort factors. So happy to talk about any of these more in depth in the to, to the extent of my ability um, in, in the Q&A if you're interested. So how predictive are they? The first generation clocks that were trained to predict chronological age, um, they're highly accurate markers of chronological age. So you'll get um, you know, correlations anywhere between 0.78 all the way up to 0.99. Um, these are now starting to be more and more used in forensics. Um, to identify uh, chronological age if a person cannot be identified. The second and third generation measures are highly predictive of mortality and associated multimorbidities, and also, as I've shown in my work, of socioeconomic status. So we're getting more signal from these clocks in terms of uh, uh, you know, prior disadvantage, things like that, that, that we care about studying. Um, and here, so this is showing, uh, this is from a paper um, on the Dunedin Pace Clock, and here they're showing in the normative aging study and in Framingham offspring, um, kind of the mortality effect size, the hazard ratio for a standard deviation increase in each of these different epigenetic clocks. And so what you can see is, is across the two, um, two studies, uh, a one standard deviation increase in these second and third generation clocks results in a roughly 55 to 65% increase in the chance of death. Um, so fairly predictive there. All right, so now that I've kind of, we're all kind of like excited to hear more about the clocks, I'm gonna show you an application uh, to my research uh, on, on fetal origins. 
Uh, so this was published towards the end of 2022, which I can't believe it's been like more than a year already. Um, and uh, this project I started with my co-author, Valentina Duque, um, when we were both postdocs at the University of Michigan. So we started this over seven years ago. Um, Valentina uh, is also an economist, and uh, she's a former student of Doug Almond's and Janet Curry's um, at, when she was at Columbia. Um, and she was really interested in looking at in utero conditions and human capital accumulation. I was studying aging. Um, and we said, you know what? Let's join forces. Let's let's look a little bit more at these, these two points in, in the life course. So to motivate the paper a little bit more, um, we know from research in the social sciences that in utero and early life events can affect adult outcomes, including health, education, and wages. Um, certainly when we started this research, much less was focused on aging, um, but I think that's that's changing rapidly. So we're seeing more and more uh, kind of long-term effects of, of in utero conditions um, on aging papers. And we know that economic fluctuations occur frequently and affect population well-being. Um, so this is an important to, to kind of understand how economic conditions are affecting our well-being and our health across the life course is, is also very important uh, from a policy perspective. On the epigenetic side, we know that during the in utero period, epigenetic mechanisms are refining genetic programs to be optimally responsive to present and future environmental challenges that they're gonna face when they are outside the womb. So, and this is what is known as fetal programming. However, um, causal research on the long-term impacts of fetal epigenetic, and program fetal epigenetic programming in humans is quite rare. Um, I can count studies on one hand. If you guys know of more, please let me know. Um, but the few exceptions that I do know of are limited to a handful of natural experiments. Um, so famously, the Dutch Hunger Winter Family Study, uh, Project Ice Storm, um, and some, some smaller studies on, on Holocaust survivors. So despite the fact that we think this might be the mechanism, uh, there just hasn't been a lot of research in humans. So what we do in this study, um, we ask how do epigenetic aging outcomes vary with exposure to economic conditions in early life? And we're gonna examine first the causal effect of exposure to the Great Depression in early life, on late life accelerated epigenetic aging using variation in economic conditions across states and years. And then we're gonna identify when in childhood these effects had their greatest impact. So we're gonna look all the way from the prenatal period up through age 16. Um, why focus on the Great Depression? Maybe this is obvious, but I think it's important um, to recap. Uh, this was a really massive economic shock. Uh, a quarter of the US labor force was unemployed fortunes were destroyed, and at the time there was really no social safety net. Um, literature suggests too that this really was a huge unexpected financial and psychological shock for, for many households. So this wasn't something that, that people were expecting. Um, of importance for this study, there was a lot of dramatic geographic and temporal variation in economic conditions throughout the depression and, and, and the subsequent New Deal uh, across states. So some states were worse off than others. And third, we can use the health and retirement study, which I always love. But I, I mentioned that here because the HRS was the first nationally representative study to collect epigenetic data that has the sample size and geographic variation we need to exploit this type of quasi-random design. So prior to the release of this, these data, um, you know, there were just smaller studies either within a state or within a single cohort, but we, we couldn't look across states, for example, and, and use that type of strategy. And I think this really expands possibilities uh, for future causal work in, in epigenetics. Uh, so this is gonna be our primary measure of the shock, um, which is a wage index by state. Um, it includes both farm and non-farm wages. So we thought it was kind of the best measure to approximate uh, what families might have been going through. Um, it's uh, indexed here to the year 1929. So you can see uh, from 1929, the precipitous fall uh, from the depression and then the slow rise uh, during the New Deal. What's important here to note is that each of these different lines is a different state. So you can see there's a lot of variation in how in kind of the depth of the depression and, and, and the rise. And so this is what we're gonna be exploiting in, in our analysis. 
Um, again, we're using the HRS. We're going to use respondents born between 1929 and 1940. So this was that original HRS cohort, um, roughly, who had their blood drawn in 2016. Um, so these are individuals who survived until 2016. They were between the ages of 75 and 84 at the time, and we were able to capture 832 survivors. Um, yes, mortality selection is the big elephant in the room, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and then we're going to link state level data on wages to individual state of birth from the in utero period all the way up to age 16. So we have this state level data on wages from 1929, I believe, all the way up to 1956 or even 59. So that allows us to capture the, the wage index in their state from the time they were born all the way through uh, age 16. And then as our outcome, we're gonna use six publicly available epigenetic aging measures that were constructed by the Health and Retirement Study. Um, this is our empir empirical specification. Um, so here again, epigenetic age acceleration is our outcome um, for individual I who was born in a given state S in year C. Um, our main exposure is gonna be wages. We have two different specifications, one where we just look at the in utero period, wages in the in utero period, and then one where we include the full age profile, which is what you're seeing here. So that's all the way again uh, from prior to birth, uh, T minus three, all the way up to, to age 16. Um, we control for sex, race, maternal education, um, year of birth fixed effects, state of birth fixed effects, and then we have a number of other uh, con controls for different state level characteristics in 1930. Um, to kind of better isolate the impact of, of the wage index. Um, and I'm also happy to talk more about um, those in uh, the Q&A. Okay, so here are results from the first model. So this is just the model where we just have uh, the in utero period, but it is otherwise the, the fully specified model. Um, each column is a different regression um, and uh, is the outcome is a different clock. So here we're looking at some of these chronological age clocks and then also the more recent second and third generation clocks. And what we see here is that for uh, one index uh, standard deviation decline, also, sorry, I should measure everything here standardized so you can compare effect sizes. Uh, so one standard deviation decline in the wage index we see here was only significant uh, in terms of the Grim age uh, and the Diddy and Poem clocks, those newer clocks. And we see about a point Three eight increase in aging for every standard deviation decline. Um, if we convert this into years, that's about 1.7 years faster aging. And I should mention that a one standard deviation decline in the wage index is just about half of the overall decline that we saw during the Great Depression. We then went on to look at the full age profile. Um, and so again, this is the fully specified model and here I'm just showing you the coefficient plot. And just what was fascinating to us is that, you know, even after including all those controls for subsequent uh, or all those wage indices for, you know, subsequent time periods past the in utero period, um, it was really the in utero period that continued to, to be significant. So this is an extremely stringent model, um, especially in 832 people. Um, and when we were looking at other aging outcomes, uh, you know, we needed as, as many as 7,000 people to get a similar um, profile. Uh, we looked at results with other aging outcomes, and we saw that these were lower in magnitude and generally less precise. Um, so again, you can compare effect sizes here. Uh, so we looked at a frailty index, metabolic syndrome, uh, self-reported health status, um, and number of chronic disease conditions. Um, Number of chronic disease conditions, which I think is actually a really good measure of aging, um, hangs in there. Um, but in general, you see that it's the clocks that are more able to pick up on uh, this, this in utero shock. So the blood was collected in 2016. And then we also were able to look at data in 2018 in the HRS. And so we wanted to look at mortality. Um, so between 2016 and 2018, roughly 7% of our sample passed away. Um, and so here uh, we wanted to see, you know, how do your aging uh, biomarkers in 2016 predict mortality in 2018? Um, and again, you can see that the epigenetic clocks are stronger predictors in general of mortality. Uh, the one holdout being self-reported health status, which hangs in there, is just a really excellent predictor of mortality. 
Um, but if you remember from the prior slide, self-reported health status was not associated with, with the in utero conditions. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it's a very blunt measure. We, we don't have as much variation to play with there. Um, so I think that might be part of the reason um, that, that we're picking up more from the in utero period with these, with these clocks. We did a bunch of additional analyses and robustness checks. Um, we looked at some other historically available measures of economic conditions. There were not many at the state level at the time. So we looked at car sales and we looked at um, employment. And we saw very similar patterns with those other two sources of historical data. Um, the results do not appear to be driven by other co-occurring events, including the Dust Bowl, um, New Deal relief spending, the spread of rural electrification. Um, and we also looked at variation in extreme weather conditions. Um, we did some inverse probability weighting to kind of look at the impact that mortality selection was having on our results. And we felt that when we took mortality selection into account with those weights, our results were attenuated by about 9 to 38%. So had we had individuals uh, who had passed away earlier in our data set, the effect sizes would be much larger. So if, any, if, if anything, these appear to be downwardly biased uh, because of mortality selection. So to wrap up the study conclusions, we find that adverse economic conditions during the Great Depression resulted in accelerated biological aging and later in life, later in life, a one standard deviation decrease in wages resulted in about a 1.7 year increase in epigenetic age relative to chronological age. Uh, the effects of the shock appear to be localized to the in utero period. And we think the results are likely a lower bound of the true effects um, due to mortality selection. And finally, these epigenetic aging measures appear to be more sensitive indicators of disparities in aging that are connected to fetal programming and subsequent mortality. Um, so I think that was something that was really interesting for us to see in this work. All right, and finally, with the few minutes that we have left, I wanna talk about some ongoing work um, and some future promises and pitfalls in the field. Um, so first let's talk about some promises of DNA methylation data. Um, a huge one is again, biomarkers of health and disease like the epigenetic clocks. Um, so this could be a potential one-stop shop for disease biomarkers if you have DNA methylation data. Um, there are already hundreds of biomarkers being developed with epigenetic data, both for specific analyte values like C-reactive protein and also for uh, you know, things like diabetes um, and other health conditions. Uh, DNA methylation effect sizes are relatively large, especially when we compare them to genomics, to effect sizes from SNPs. Um, and so because of this, composite biomarkers can be trained and applied in smaller samples. Um, so most of these clocks were trained in samples uh, with sample sizes anywhere from 5,000 to 8,000 people. You know from GWAS, you need sometimes, you know, hundreds of thousands, even up to a million to get effect sizes from SNPs to have the power to detect. Um, you know, I think again, what's really important and interesting to all of us in this room is that they can also elucidate biological mechanisms or help us elucidate mechanisms on the pathway between shocks and disease outcomes. And finally, and something I'm gonna talk about a little bit more is they might help us identify uh, or, or create biomarkers of past or current exposures. So let me talk a little bit more about that. So we know that retrospective collection of exposure data is subject to recall bias, misclassification, and oftentimes it's really impossible to collect for some exposures. So for example, prenatal smoking, right? That's not something that an individual might be aware of. Uh, exposure to lead, you know, and, and when individuals were exposed to lead and for how long. Um, these are all really important factors uh, for us to be aware of when we're studying health disparities. And here I'm just gonna show you one example um, in terms of what's being done to create really accurate predictors of prenatal smoking. Um, so you can now using DNA methylation data, identify whether your mother smoked uh, when you were in the womb. And those CPG sites that are flagged for prenatal smoking are different from own smoking. So we can differentiate own smoking behavior from a uh, smoking exposure in utero. And so I think that's really fascinating. Um, we can also with smoking, um, you know, these quantitative DNA methylation scores are showing promise estimating dosage effects. So time since quitting and also number of pack years smoked. 
Now I'll say smoking is like kind of low hanging fruit because it, it wreaks havoc on the epigenome. Um, but we're seeing folks developing these for alcohol use and abuse, um, as well as um, you know other exposures. Of course, for me, I got really interested in thinking about socioeconomic status. And so I have some ongoing work with uh, Jen Smith at the University of Michigan. She's a genetic epidemiologist. And we wanted to see, could we take uh, data in the HRS and develop biomarkers of childhood and adult socioeconomic status? And the kind of motivation here, the rationale, was that these could be useful proxies in epidemiological studies where socioeconomic status is not well characterized. And also this could really help augment our current knowledge on biological mechanisms and pathways between socioeconomic status and health. So we can take a deeper look at the CPG sites that the machine learning algorithm selects, and then we can look at the functional characterization of those, functional characterization of those CPG sites. So what we did here is we trained and tested uh, DNA methylation-based biomarkers of both child and adult SES um, in two large multiracial ethnic samples of older adults. Um, so in both MESA and the Health and Retirement Study, we trained it in the Health and Retirement Study, and we tested it in MESA. And um, we call these ASES bio and CSES bio. Um, and uh, I can talk more too about how we did all of this um, and also what we were using to measure child and adult socioeconomic status. But uh, we used kind of a broad measure definition of SES that includes both individual SES, so income, wealth, um, education, and also some ecological or sociological factors like neighborhood uh, disadvantage. Um, and for childhood, we mostly looked at parental education and then also um, the, the measures of childhood financial strain that they have in the HRS. So we created indices with those, and then we trained the methylation data on those indices. And what we found is that for adult SES in particular, we got a little bit better prediction there. Um, the biomarker uh, explains about 4% of the variation in socioeconomic status in MESA in our, in our test data, um, which again is, is not bad given that we did this in 3000 individuals, um, again, who were you know, experiencing, you know, who are older, all this sort of um, stuff. A lot of this was retrospective. So it is capturing something interesting. Um, we then looked at how these ASCS bio and CSCS, CSCS bio uh, indicators were associated with downstream morbidity and mortality. Um, and so here, sorry, it's a little hard to read, a little small. Um, we see uh, in the first model here, we have the biomarker with your basic demographic controls. We see that's um, associated downstream with number of chronic conditions, cardiometabolic conditions, self-reported health status, um, the childhood, not as much, but we get a, a little bit stronger here from adult, also mortality. Uh, we didn't see much with dementia. Um, then in model two, what we did was we added the, the self-reported indices. So we added the phenotypic SES into the model. And as you can see, that didn't budge things much. So this is predictive even after including self-reported uh, SES. And then finally, and you don't see that up here, we also threw the clocks in there. So we wanted to see, are we identifying unique CPG sites um, you know, or, or kind of signal signatures um, over and above what the clocks have found? And uh, we still are finding unique signal there. When we characterize these CPG sites, um, we find that they're in regions that regulate gene expression. Um, in particular, the childhood uh, biomarker sites were associated more with autoimmune disorders, uh, cancer, and allergic diseases, which kind of uh, dovetails with a lot of the, the literature on childhood socioeconomic status and uh, kind of neighborhood and, and um, toxic and exposures and so forth. And then for the ASCS bio, the adult, a biomarker, we found more associations with inflammation and, and metabolic disorders. So this is ongoing work. I don't have a paper out yet, uh, but we should soon. So happy to talk more about that as well. And then uh, finally, let's talk about some pitfalls. Um, a big one is what's called the tissue issue. Um, and this is that each cell or tissue type has a different epigenome. Because remember, I was telling you the epige epigenetics are helping to kind of differentiate cells and cellular function. And so because of this, the predictive accuracy of biomarkers may vary in different cells or tissue types. And blood-based biomarkers, which is the majority of what you see, may not always be reflective of disease processes in other tissues. 
So ideally, you know, if we were studying dementia, for example, we would want brain tissue. We would want to profile the epigenome of the brain tissue. Um, but we know that's very difficult to acquire. Um, and so there's a lot of ongoing research of, you know, how much can we learn from these blood-based biomarkers about other diseases? Um, a lot of really interesting research going on there. Um, the second is reverse causation. So epigenomes of cells can also change as the result of disease rather than being a part of the causal process leading to the disease. So this is something we really have to think critically about uh, and we need more longitudinal data. So right now we have a lot of cross-sectional data, but really ideally we'd want uh, longitudinal data to really see these changes over time and to better isolate um, mechanisms. The third is, you know, that these, these data can be very messy. So if you're going to collect your own data, you know, you work with a good lab, have some really good bioinformaticians that you're working with, um, because the data are really sensitive to experimental conditions and batch effects. Um, and so you really need to properly QC the data. And then fourth and, and last, the DNA methylation is influenced both by the environment and genetics. And I think that's something that is, is still really being studied and, and understood. Um, so these DNA methylation uh, signatures of exposure or disease may vary or be influenced by ancestry. Um, and this leads me to um, what I'll kind of leave you guys with, which is this uh, big project that I'm currently undertaking, uh, which is social epigenetics research in Malawi. The vast majority of research, pretty much all of it, on epigenetic aging is in high income countries. Um, and we know very little about how these clocks perform in different conditions in low income countries or even low middle income countries. Um, and so we really wanted to know, do epigenetic clocks constructed in high income countries capture aging in a low income country context? And so I'm um, the co-PI co-leading a large grant with Hans-Peter Kohler um, that's funding the genetic and epigenetic data collection um, of individuals in the Malawi Longitudinal Study of Families and Health. So this is an ongoing longitudinal study in Malawi. It's been following individuals for roughly 25 years. Um, and now these individuals are beginning to age. And so there's huge interest in, in, to, in studying the aging process um, and to really assess epigenetic aging in a low income context where individuals have had lifelong exposures to adversity and, and also lower life expectancy. Um, so the study population, most individuals live on less than a dollar a day um, and they're, they're subsistence agricultural farmers. Um, so, and this is about 80% of the population of Malawi. Um, it's the fourth poorest country in the world. And what's really important to me, to, to me as well is that this project is gonna help alleviate disparities in the availability of both genetic and epigenetic data in African ancestry populations. So this entire kind of region of Africa, uh, which is incredibly diverse genetically, has really never been, been profiled. So we know very little about the genetics of this, this region. Um, and uh, I'll leave you with some um, pictures from our recent pilot data collection. So this past November, I traveled for the first time to Malawi uh, with my uh, colleague, uh, Ileana Kohler, who runs the study with Hans Pater. Um, and yeah, we collected dried blood spots on 50 individuals, um, and we're gonna scale that up to 3,500 this summer. Um, so we just had those run at the lab. We're going to be testing them, looking if we can improve on any of our collection procedures. Um, but yeah, this was this was four years in, in the making. Seeing these dried blood spots on these cards um, in the field was incredible. Um, here we are working with uh, professors and researchers at the College of Malawi, uh, the College of Medicine. So we have a really active collaboration with uh, scholars uh, in Malawi. Uh, that's me with Ilana, with my NJ, um, and in the village. Um, here are some of our interviewers. So we're testing the, the protocol here, which we have to collect everything outdoors. And then here's kind of a typical uh, village scene. And then here's Malawi. Right, so that's everything. So thank you. Um, acknowledging funding from the NIA and, and the CRR for this work. And again, check us, check us out on the web. <laughs>